the foramen ovale here and if we look from the outside I will now place this one to mimic the nerve we see from the outside that the nerve exits from the foramen ovale which is just lateral and anterior or posteriorly to the pterygoid process and then comes in about this direction over the mandible innervating as the mesenteric nerve the masseter muscle. On a specimen, um, on a model, the anatomy depicted of the facial nerve here within the parotid gland, the main stem would be lower and coming out lateral. We see that just anteriorly to the gland, here in the duct, the masseter muscle is underneath, so it's medial to the gland and the innervation of the masseter muscle, as we saw it before, is coming from the foramen ovale, which will be in the depth medial to the zygomatic arch here, here is zygoma. So coming from the medial side into the muscle. We're showing here on the specimens first our landmarks. For the greater auricular nerve, we know now the landmarks of the angle of the mandible, the mastoid tip, tragus would be here anteriorly, and we know that the line between angle of the mandible and mastoid tip bisected would be the course of the nerve. So if you have this line, we expect the nerve to come approximately here, and then it will go to the tragus, innervate the ear in this area. Maybe there's one nerve or this already separated the nerves. But if you just need to find the nerve and you don't do a parodidectomy approach, you may just make a small incision on this side and you will find the nerve underneath. The second landmark for the nerve is the external jugular vein. Now here in this specimen it's not shown because it's not felt, but let's assume that this is about the course of the vein and the nerve is in most instances just posteriorly to the external jugular vein. In many male patients the vein is easily visible, so these are the two landmarks to find the greater auricular nerve for a nerve graft. When we go now to the masseteric nerve, we have here the zygoma. So the zygomatic arch is in this area. We would have the joint of the mandible here. So the joint is in this area. And here you can palpate, if I move the joint a little bit, the indentation here, where we expect the nerve to come out the V3 mandibular nerve. Anterior portion is the motor portion and one part of the motor portion is the masseteric nerve so it should come out about in this area to innervate the masseter muscle from underneath. Having these landmarks it now depends on uh, what procedure exactly you're planning. We can now do the skin incisions. Now it is nice for any parotidectomy to have an incision which is almost not visible and almost not visible means that we start anteriorly to the ear and then in the, like in the endoral incision we go between the tragus and the root of the helix. We then pass with our knife underneath the tragus. So we will put the tragus a little bit forward and then underneath the tragus about two or three millimeters. So this scar is hidden here. We then exit again at this side and go around the earlobe. And now again we have two options. Either we do the standard parotidectomy approach by now going into a skin crease here. So we go through this area and extend it within the skin crease or in case of a younger patient you want to do a facelift type incision so you extend your incision behind the ear you can go even a little bit upwards towards the hairline 
we usually shave one centimeter of hairline for easier wound closure and then you go along the hairline and usually you have to go a little bit anteriorly here again in a skin crease so with this incision like a facelift incision we hide this part of the incision we hide this part of the incision behind the ear and this one will be along the hairline so this would be for a younger patient a facelift type incision now in an older patient of course there are many skin creases here anteriorly so we may also use in an elderly patient the skin crease right here which will make the scar almost invisible now for this dissection we plan this type of an incision behind the tragus and then the standard parotidectomy incision because I'd like to show you also the position of the greater auricular nerve. We can make the incision now through the cartilage, come out here inferiorly, but you see here the cartilage of the tragus. In the specimen, the skin easily detaches, but you need to go through the cartilage, and at the later stage, you will have a hook here. But this will be the incision which will be invisible at the later stage. Then we go with our incision around the earlobe and go posteriorly towards the mastoid tip here. We use the anterior incision, so going here through that skin and then curving here over Now this, the extension really depends on uh, how much you need to expose the parotid and then we can develop the skin flap. First, uh, I want to identify the greater auricular nerve and we have marked this at the outside and let's see whether we were right. So we dissect parallel to the nerve through the subcutaneous tissue. I see here this is the greater auricular nerve. It's almost where we were expecting the nerve. If you if you pull back, you see again the landmark angle of the mandible. Now because we pull a little bit on the skin. My skin mark has been moved forward, but this is the angle of the mandible, mastoid tip about halfway. Uh, exactly as we were expecting the nerve, here would be the great auricular nerve. You can follow the nerve superiorly as well as inferiorly, and you will get about six to eight centimeters in length. Now we will continue now with the parotidectomy approach. So we can place a stay suture here and just with a clamp hold it posteriorly and this will help you also in finding the proper plane here anteriorly when we go later towards the facial nerve so one landmark for the facial nerve which will be the tragal cartilage is easily found because we've already seen the tragal cartilage upon dissection we can go it's a very thin specimen here so there's not much subcutaneous tissue But we stay within the uh, subcutaneous fat. Also here superiorly. To dissect the 
flap forward you will have vessels the vessels of the temporalis arteries here we go more and more anteriorly here is the zygoma we still need to go more anteriorly at the outer border I usually prefer the tunnel technique uh, also in parotid surgery so if you go here and you make a tunnel because you're coming to the anterior edge of the parotid gland the facial nerve will not go into the skin so by tunneling between subcutaneous tissue and skin you know that you're not cutting into facial nerve branches here because again the facial nerve goes into the musculature so having it here we can easily and safely dissect anteriorly to the parotid where the facial nerve becomes more superficial next we will develop the SMAS flap the SMAS flap is actually part of the subcutaneous tissue parotid capsula and then anteriorly the platysma so we have to find a plane between the actual parotid this is very helpful especially in tumors where you need to dissect a lot of tissue and now you need to place small clamps on that border and the assistant needs to tell me if I'm almost transecting this mass you see already here parotid this is already opened a little bit open parotid tissue it has been said and we studied this ourselves that this is the one of the vessels that I told you that this mass flap will avoid phrase syndrome later on in parotid surgery that is not true this mass flap will delay the phrase syndrome and will make it probably less severe but it does not avoid it unfortunately but you see here nicely the parotid capsula parotid tissue here and we can dissect this mass flap anteriorly now here is already a nerve this could be the frontal branch you see here this is a small nerve here just underneath so we are aware that dissecting here and the fat tissue that we already see branches of the facial nerve because we are outside the parotid gland this is the articulation here so we expect the nerve to come out underneath medial to the zygomatic arch and to run about in this direction so this is the uh, mandible uh, the head of the mandible the articulation and we expect the nerve down here I like to use some uh, peanuts uh, now the nurses may, may give you this clamp like this so this you cannot use because it's very floppy and you cannot dissect so you have to ask your nurse to place it two-thirds into the clamp see two-thirds one-third is out or one-fourth and this is now very stable it will not move around and you can easily dissect and at the same time control the bleeders but make sure the nurse has given you the peanut in this way into your instrument so we have on the left side the peanut and on the right hand as a right-handed surgeon we are now looking for peripheral facial nerve branches within the parotid gland we always dissect parallel to the nerve so the nerve branches will come out here stella mastoid foramen landmark is mastoid tip and diga and tragus so in between middle of the tragus and mastoid tip this line bisecting this line this will be the position of the facial nerve but we're not going right now for the main stem but we're looking for peripheral branches and this is why we dissect parallel to the facial nerve maybe right here we'll see whether we'll find some peripheral branches and then you have two choices you follow the peripheral branches proximally to find the main stem or you find the main stem first and then see the peripheral branches but here we have a branch see here can 
then follow this nerve branch staying on the nerve and opening up and then maybe cut a little bit here now we don't want to transect the base of our smash flap so I'm just uh, cutting a little bit here into the area so we can see better here the nerve that we see here one of these nerve branches here and now we can follow this nerve even proximally towards the main stem so this will be the situation. we will first identify in this patient the main stem of the facial nerve assuming that we need to anastomose also towards the main stem we have found here the greater auricular nerve here we can follow the nerve as much in the periphery as needed and then we go anteriorly along the sternocleidomastoid muscle there's usually thick ligaments and go to our next landmark which will be the tracheal cartilage So as a landmark, we have two landmarks here, one will be digastric muscle, and there, and the second one will be the tracheal cartilage. Now let's go first to the tracheal cartilage, so we stay close to the tragus. You open widely. Now the next landmark will be the digastric muscle. Which is down there. Now at this stage I will change from having a pickup in my one hand to the technique that I showed you before with the peanut. Again the peanut uh, is helping the surgeon to control the bleeders and to push the tissue away. We will facial nerve monitor will not help because we have a long standing facial palsy here. So we have to go by our landmarks. There's often a small vessel covering the facial nerve, the artery. In the artery, there is a small artery here, as you can see in here. If I find an artery in the depth, this is a good hint that the facial nerve will be very close by. So it's better to um, coagulate this artery properly. And here will be the facial nerve, probably right this one. So again, our landmarks. show you in a minute but here we are on the facial nerve follow the facial nerve in the to the periphery but first maybe for the landmarks to find this is the main stem of the facial nerve to find it we have the tragal cartilage the center of the tragal cartilage the mastoid tip this has moved a little bit because of traction the mastoid tip is here tragal cartilage is here and the line bisecting is leading you to the facial nerve. Uh, oftentimes you read the pointer. I'm not relying on the pointer because yes the tragal cartilage points to the facial nerve but I find these landmarks which Professor Fish told us for many years anteriorly middle of the tragus master tip line in between is a very good anatomical border. So we go towards the periphery
So when we do a um, type C approach or even a type B approach and we need to raise this area up here we know that the frontal branch is running in the fat pad so if you stay lateral to the fat pad there will not be a facial nerve stator muscle. If you can follow the branches of course into the periphery you can now easier dissect in between the branches that you want to preserve to find the masseteric nerve. You see it's coming from here so here we have even more nice branches. We want to go now here into the depth and here comes the muscle. Have to be careful that I'm not dissecting already into the muscle so let's follow here that peripheral nerve Identify here the masseter muscle. Maybe we can even go here now to the zygoma. Let's assume there's no nerve here in between. <laughs> of course, we would more carefully dissect that we are not transecting a nerve going here to the zygoma, but yeah, you can cut, cut for sake of demonstration. We, this would be the nerve. I would not cut it with my pickups, of course, like this. So here we have the proper anatomy, the facial nerve here, the uh, masseter muscle here, and uh, we have the facial branch a little in our way, and we know that the masseteric nerve is within the muscle coming from the medial side. Now in a clinical patient there will be motor innervation for the masseteric nerve, so you could use the stimulator, and I prefer the monopolar stimulator, just to localize where approximately you can expect the nerve. Or in case you're not sure if this is the nerve, you can use the bipolar stimulator to find the nerve. Now the nerve is in the muscle itself, so we may come from posteriorly and get into the muscle layer by layer. Since we are disconnecting the uh, innervation anyhow, the muscle will not be pulling anymore, so we can take part of the muscle. Be aware that here and superiorly, uh, along the root of the zygoma, you have fibrous attachment of the muscle towards the zygoma. So this can mimic, like from the color, the nerve itself. But it's not the nerve, it's just fibrous attachment. So go a little bit deeper, about one, one and a half centimeters below the root of the zygoma. And we do this here. And we will open here a little bit the muscle. So that would be the first layer of muscle, which we can place to the side. Maybe here the retractor can hold this part and this part and we go from posteriorly one level deeper and here already we see something so we follow here and it looks like a nerve Go as much as we can to the periphery to have a long nerve. We can also go more proximally, but we don't really need that because we don't detach it proximally. We want to detach it in the periphery. So again, for the landmark, you remember we had the uh, specimen, just the bony landmark, zygomatic arch the mandible and then the notch of the mandible here and fairly within that notch we were expecting the nerve and exactly here it is we were separating the lateral third of the muscle which is up here and within the muscle now we can see the nerve right here 
for the anatomists and the surgeons, there has been a nice description by Borchel in 2012, and he had two uh, landmarks or two distances. One is uh, the distance from the tragus to find the masseteric nerve is about three centimeters, and if you look here, this is the tragus, and within the three centimeters, we can locate the nerve here in the depth. Here would be the nerve. So three centimeters anteriorly and about one centimeter inferiorly to the zygoma. This is correct. You see one centimeter inferiorly and three centimeters anteriorly. In this position, we will locate and we have located the masseteric nerve. I told you not to go within this one centimeter because here you have all the fibrous attachments of the muscle which can mimic a, a nerve because they're all white. But if you stay one centimeter below and about three centimeters anteriorly within the muscle and we dissected about a third of the muscle here laterally. If I can show this again, we didn't excise the muscle part, but this was the masseter muscle covering here the field so within the muscle we were going one plane deeper and we found the nerve itself but we were also taking care not to dissect within the facial nerve we were looking for facial nerve branches and we're dissecting in between these facial nerve branches as you can see here and here so this is masseteric nerve and now we have a couple of options. Option number one is that we can make an anastomosis by now cutting the nerve. Maybe a, the retractor again. I'm now cutting the nerve here in the periphery. Undermining it a little bit. nerve, having some tissue around it to hold it. So here we can anastomose the nerve now with any branch that we want to anastomose from the facial nerve side. So we have here a nice nerve. So we could do an anastomosis here. Maybe that's the uh, mid-face lower eyelid branch. We would need to see how they end. So it would be a direct anastomosis of the masseteric nerve towards the facial nerve. Or in case of a facial, complete facial paralysis and we want to innervate the main stem of the facial nerve, maybe we can use a vessel loop to mark this nerve. And then we can transect the facial nerve before its bifurcation actually two options. Either you can go also into the mastoid and find the facial nerve as far proximal as possible to have a long course of the facial nerve for a direct anastomosis. So in whatever additional skull based procedure you plan this would be possible to do a direct anastomosis. Or we cut the nerve as proximal as possible and then bring the nerve laterally. It will not be have the sufficient length for a direct anastomosis. This would be great for auricular nerve. Please take sufficient length. Please take excess length. Never make a short anastomosis, but take enough nerve graft. So we would ner do a nerve anastomosis, and then lay the nerve. Maybe that's a little too long, but then anastomose the nerve to the facial nerve. So this would be a, an interposition graft, greater auricular nerve or sural nerve if there is no greater auricular nerve between the masseteric nozzle and the facial nerve or a direct anastomosis to mid branches or whatever branch you prefer with the masseteric nerve in addition to maybe another hypoglossal facial or whatever anastomosis you're planning. Now for the closure when we uh, close the wound we still have the uh, SMAS flap so we can pull on the SMAS flap. Here is our SMAS flap, which will nicely cover the defect or the dissection that you've made. And by pulling a little bit the SMAS flap backwards, we will also pull and do a facelift for that patient, which is immediately very helpful for facial paralysis patients. 
I had the help of Dr. Lee from China and from Dr. Mulasimoglu from Turkey and I'm very grateful for that.